Welcome to Hidden Hill Ranch. For over three generations, our family has brought only the finest cuts of meat to the table. Now, some people might give us grief for rearing dogs, but our dogs are free range, sustainably raised, and humanely slaughtered. The best meat comes from happy dogs, and the happiest dogs are here at Hidden Hill Ranch. Five years ago, a family adopts a puppy. The pup's name is Mikey. Mikey's known nothing but love and care and affection since the moment of his birth. He's had a wonderful life. So wonderful, in fact, that Mikey's life is better than that of your average human child. And so, after half a decade of taking care of Mikey, the family has decided that the time has come to cash in on the investment. Mikey is what is for dinner. It's going to be very respectful. They're going to use every part of Mikey's body, none of Mikey is going to go to waste, and he's just going to be completely and totally honored. I don't know how the family is going to get it done, but Mikey's death is going to be completely painless and stress-free. Mikey will probably be killed in his sleep. So it's dreams of bones, and then... So, does the family have the ethical green light to kill Mikey? Before you say no, probably not, Take into account the fact that Mikey was bred for this exact purpose. Mikey's mom was inseminated at the request of the family. Also take into account the fact that Mikey's had a better life than most human children, maybe even you included. Mikey is a member of the bourgeoisie class. Mikey is the 1%. <laughs> All desires satisfied, not a care in the world, no expense spared. It's time to eat the rich, baby. And finally, Mikey's not going to feel any pain, and he's not going to see it coming. If it helps, you can suppose that instead of being a golden retriever, Mikey was a pig. Nothing really changes in the ethical calculus. If anything, it becomes even more ethically dicey because Mikey is now smarter as a pig than he was as a dog. This is the steel man case for humane slaughter. I don't know how you can make the life of the animal more idyllic, or the slaughter more humane. If anything, this is too idyllic a scenario, and it'll never happen. Steel man, by the way, is the opposite of a straw man. Damn man. Uh oh. In a strawman argument, you take the opposition's case and you misrepresent it on purpose. And then you show how silly your fabricated misrepresentation is, and then you win the argument. You create a straw version of the argument you're supposed to be arguing against. Steel man arguments, on the other hand, take the opposition's case and try to construct the strongest possible version of it. You construct a steel version of the opposition. It's kind of like the benefit of the doubt on steroids. The reasoning that explains whether the family is ethically cool to kill Mikey is a collection of closely entangled concepts, and there's no great place to start. So I propose that we just throw a dart at a dartboard and take it from there. Hey, this is the section I wanted to start with. What are the chances? Someone's welfare is a measure of how well or ill they fare. Welfare. In order to have a welfare, you need to be conscious and you need to have beliefs and desires. If you're conscious, you can experience things. And if you have beliefs and desires, you can have an opinion about what it is that you're experiencing. As in, is the experience pleasant or unpleasant? And Mikey is clearly conscious and has beliefs and desires. If you're unsure about this fact, please check out our previous videos on belief and consciousness. Maybe we'll link them in the description box below. I don't know. YouTubers usually do this. <laughs> so Mikey has a welfare, but what does it mean to fare well? There are two broad types of interests. First, you have preference interests. Suppose you're really into Reddit. You enjoy condescension, feelings of false superiority, fruitless arguments, and figuring out who did the Boston bombing. Whoo, we did it, Reddit. Then we can say you have a preference for Reddit, as in you have a preference interest. Preference interests can be thought of as personal preferences. I'm using the word preference a lot here. Don't know how I feel about that. And then there's welfare interests. These are the things that are in the interest of your welfare, such as exercise, or finally deleting your Reddit account, or blocking the reddit.com domain, and finally leaving your room and living in peace.
And then of course you have your standard conflicts between preference and welfare interests. Drugs are fun. Drugs are also bad. Food is delicious, but food can also be calorically devastating. You get the idea. Things that interest you may not always be in your interest, and things that are in your interest may not always interest you. And so here is the first piece of the welfare puzzle. If you're going to live well, you are going to have to have your preference interests and your welfare interests harmoniously satisfied. You can't just have one or the other. I don't know why I'm doing so much shit with my hands. I talk with my hands, goddammit! For example, Mikey could be fed exclusively treats, but if those treats don't contain adequate nutrition, Mikey will fare ill. I could be your YouTuber with benefits. I'm gonna do what it takes for the animals. If one hand job equals one saved life, then I'm gonna use both hands. DM me. Benefits allow for the satisfaction of preference and welfare interests. So benefits don't actually improve your welfare, they just make faring well possible. The most straightforward example is money. If you don't have money, then you won't fare well. It's also an example of how benefits and interests can overlap. Having tons of cash might be an interest of yours. And so in that case, the benefit would also be satisfying an interest. Notice though, that while having tons of cash is a benefit, it allows for better welfare, but doesn't guarantee it. For example, you can have tons of cash, and you can squander it by buying fucking JPEGs. And so then the benefit of being wealthy didn't actually improve your welfare. Money is also interesting in that it is a uniquely human benefit. No amount of cash is useful to a pigeon. So while some benefits are uniquely human, others are universal. So you've got your food, shelter, water, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And you can see where this is going. If we're going to talk about animal welfare, it'll be the universal interests that will be of interest to us. Individuals are harmed when their welfare is seriously diminished, and there are two primary ways to go about harming somebody. Inflictions and deprivations. Suppose someone punches you in the face. If the only consequence was a minute's worth of pain, you were hurt, but you were not harmed. You could maybe say that your welfare was seriously diminished for the duration of that one minute, but in the grand scheme of things, the face punch came, went, and was forgotten. But if that punch in the face created some sort of chronic condition where your face was permanently in some sort of pain, then your welfare has been seriously diminished and you've been harmed. See what I mean? To say that something has significantly diminished the quality of your life, that something needs to last more than just a moment. A contrived example might be an explosion that causes PTSD and nothing else. It's the PTSD that harms you, not the explosion. It's the memory of the sandy cheek cockvor, not the sight of the image. Please don't Google that. There's also, of course, cases where temporary harms might ultimately be benefits, like wearing braces or reading marks. Temporarily sucks, but good in the long run. The point is that for an infliction to become a harm, it must cause suffering. It must inflict prolonged and severe pain. Say the line, Bart! The question is not can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? Why should the law refuse its protection to any sensitive being? The time will come when humanity will extend its mantle over everything which breathes. Some words of wisdom from my boy Bentham! If you're looking to be sneakier, then a more subtle way to diminish someone's welfare is via deprivation. The most trivial example is again Maslow's needs. If you withhold water from someone, then you aren't inflicting any kind of injury, but you will cause suffering. A more interesting example of harm by deprivation is when the victim isn't aware of the fact that they are being harmed. Imagine a kid that has never seen the light of day. Since birth, the kid has been kept in the basement by the parents. And the kid's name is Stacy. The parents make sure that Stacy has no idea that the outside world exists. And so obviously, even though Stacy has no idea that she is being harmed, she is being harmed. It doesn't matter whether Stacy is aware of this or not. And an even more interesting example of this is the it was me Barry meme. The basic premise is that everything bad that has ever happened to the Flash, aka Barry, was done to Barry by Zoom, aka Reverse Flash. Reverse Flash was able to get this done undetected via supersonic speed. So for example, you remember the time that you tried to fart quietly and ended up shitting your pants in the gym? It was me, Barry! I shit your pants! You remember that time that girl was going down on you and she did that thing with her fingers and it made you wonder if you were gay for a little while? That wasn't her, Barry! Remember when you were making out with your first girlfriend, and you came right as she touched your leg? It was me, Barry. 
I jerked you off at super speed so it'd seem like you nutted at just a woman's touch! And our academic contribution here is that when Zoom jerked Barry off at supersonic speed and brought Barry to climax <laughs> without Barry's consent and made it look like Barry nutted at just a woman's touch, Zoom harmed Barry, whether Barry knew it or not. Well, Mikey certainly has a welfare. He's conscious, and he has beliefs and desires. In fact, Mikey's faring very well. He's got all the benefits in the world, his preference interests and welfare interests are being harmoniously satisfied, and he's the goodest, happiest boy in the world. Mikey also doesn't suffer any harms as inflictions. He's not suffering in any way. But even with all that, killing Mikey would still obviously diminish his welfare. It would be the end of Mikey's welfare. Remember that we established that deprivation is a form of harm, and death is the ultimate deprivation. It's the end of the possibility of satisfying any kind of interests. There are of course cases where death is preferable to life, but we're not talking about euthanizing Mikey, we're talking about humanely slaughtering him. We also established that harms are harms, regardless of whether the victim knows that they're being harmed or not, so the fact that Mikey is killed in his sleep does not make this any less of a harm to him. So then we can agree that Mikey is harmed, and this harm isn't in his welfare interests, and there is nothing benevolent or compassionate about it, and therefore nothing humane in this humane slaughter. Unless the family can somehow justify the harm. For most people, the fact that Mikey had a good life leading up to the slaughter is the justification for the harm. Treating Mikey well and giving him a good life entitles the family to slaughter him. And this is false. Treating Mikey well in the past does not entitle the family to treat him poorly in the present. One could try to elaborate and say that it is better for Mikey to have been born and have had a beautiful, although cut short life, than to not have been born at all. See, if the family didn't want dog meat, then Mikey's mom would not have been artificially inseminated and then Mikey wouldn't exist. Setting aside the ethically dicey issues of bringing Mikey into the world, the problem is that the family doesn't have to kill Mikey. It's a harm to him, no matter which way you cut it. The family could take care of Mikey and not kill him. That would be the actually humane thing to do. Using the exact same logic, I could say that I should have as many kids as I want, give them an okay life, and then kill them whenever I please, because having some life is better than having no life, right? And the arguments for eating Mikey only go downhill from here. We, as people, need protein. Meat is a way to obtain it. If we treat the animals humanely, it's okay to eat them in the end. My best understanding of the argument is that humans need protein, therefore we need meat. Therefore, we need to kill animals, and it's okay to kill animals, so long as they're treated humanely. We already established that there is no humane way to slaughter an animal, so therefore there must be some sort of justification for the harm. The justification here is that humans need protein, and while this is true, we do not need to get it from eating animals. And there isn't exactly a shortage of statements by medical bodies on the topic. And while we're here, OP also makes the statement, I was on Tumblr, and someone made this call out post that was like, oh my god, people who say OP are so weird. Can you believe they say OP like they're spelling the letters out and someone just goes, what the fuck do you say? Op? <laughs> While we're here, Op makes this statement. Or like Midwestern, OP, since I've got my cowboy hat on, OP. And while we're here, OP also makes the statement. Eating meat and killing fellow living beings for survival is natural. But of course, something being natural does not mean it's ethical. There's lots of, say, infanticide going on in the animal kingdom, and I don't think that anyone would say, well, infanticide's good actually, because it's natural, organic, fair trade, GMO-free infanticide. All natural, baby. I feel bad for all the good vegans out there who are vegans for a cause, and don't put the others down because the bad ones give the entire group a terrible rep. Respect each other's food choices, whether they are vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, omnivores, carnivores, photosynthesizing, you get the idea. Photosynthesizing? To paraphrase this, eating animals is a personal choice, and so therefore, my animal consumption is none of your business. And the response is, the animals being eaten probably don't think it's purely personal choice. When someone decides to eat an animal, the animal is involved, and by involved, I mean killed. 
Eating meat doesn't fall under personal decision any more than theft or assault does. And let's not even mention... I can't believe you don't know about the food chain, dude. It's in the slaughter part. And in more nuance, it's in the harm of deprivation. Which means there's no such thing as humane meat. And I think that on some level, everyone knows that. Doing all this philosophy is a neat way to make things rigorous. But if there was an animal being needlessly slaughtered in front of you, you would know that it is wrong. Fancy ethical framework, or no. When it comes to ethics, it's easy to get lost in the semantics. And to forget that the reason you're talking about this at all is to try to improve things. It's not just a logic puzzle. It is very easy to focus on winning instead of actually communicating. And the thing that we can all agree on is that we all love animals. They are cute, they don't know stuff, and they deserve all the love in the world. No one is pro-animal cruelty. All we have to do is align our actions with our beliefs and to stop treating animals as products. Not for the sake of ethical purity or social points, but for the sake of the animals that we're supposed to be taking care of. Think of the philosophy as a way to see more clearly and to cut through the noise. So when someone says, I think it's okay to kill animals if they had a good life, you can explain to them that there is no such thing as humane slaughter.